It's amazing to think that it's been nearly 40 years since the Challenger disaster. And today we're going to be delving into it on the Damcasters with Adam Higginbotham. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. And like I said in the intro, we're going to be chatting Challenger today because Adam Higginbotham is joining us and he has written this quite remarkable book, which is Challenger, a true story of heroism and disaster on the edge of space. And for me, as I mentioned in the episode, Challenger is probably one of my first memories of hero stuff going wrong. And I'll get into that more in the episode, but it's left this indelible mark throughout NASA ever since. And it's interesting that even the, the, the result of the heat shield being found by the Bermuda Triangle team of, of Dave and Wayne, check out that episode link up above, it caused a massive stir because watching that happen live on television with a teacher going to space burned it into the psyche for everyone. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about many of the processes and some of the remarkable people who tried very hard to stop the launch in a turn of events, which Adam covers incredibly. So we're going to start off by finding out where was Adam when Challenger exploded 73 seconds into her flight. Adam, thank you so much for joining us on on the pod for this one, because I thoroughly enjoyed your book. And that, as we were saying before we started recording, that sort of process detail that you go into in the Challenger disaster is just wonderfully put across. And as, you know, my wife's reading it at the moment and is, is enjoying it as well. So there you go. Well, thank to, you for having me. I'm, yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was great. And I, I think that's, let's start with a personal question, really, which was with both of us being gentlemen of an age that can actually remember this thing. Where were you on that January morning when Challenger exploded? Uh, I was at school in England. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was actually that January afternoon. And, um, and it was being in the 20th century. I, uh, what happened is I spent the day at school. I then went straight out from school with a, with a load of my friends after school and spent the evening, I was 17 at the time, I spent the evening in a pub. And then um, my, when I got home late that night, my mother told me what had happened. And, you know, that was, so that was the first I'd heard of it, m many hours after the news had actually come through. Uh, and I, I still remember how, how kind of incomprehensible that seemed. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons it's it's such a kind of it was such a turning point in in history in America particularly because it it just seemed unimaginable that that an agency as as super competent and and apparently capable of achieving the impossible on a regular basis as NASA you know could be responsible for something like that happening at all let alone happening you know live on on television in front of millions of school children. I was one of those school children. Cause, oh, you were? Yeah, we, we, we got them. We, uh, I was seven at the time. And we had, in schools in Canada, we were following it. So we had the Krista McAuliffe. All, there, we were going to get to watch the experiments that she did and things. So we, oh, could right. either, we could either go in early and watch it at school or stay, come in late and watch it at home. So I did. And my mum very quickly... When she realized what was happening, turned the TV off and me being a teeny tiny airplane geek kind of knew exactly what had happened. But I, 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 I say I can remember it. I can, but it's, it's one of those things that, you know, we, we would always talk about, but yeah. It's, so yeah, so this, your, your book brought back, brought back memories. And yeah, then as you grow up, you always talked about which school teacher you'd quite like on an exploding shuttle, but. That's a grim bit of teenage humor, isn't it? Your previous book was about Chernobyl. And this, you've sort of chosen two disasters. And I just wanted to ask you that process question. You approach these books by looking at the sort of long tail of an accident. As an author, how do you 
make that a narrative? Because working in process, it can usually be this happened, this happened, this happened. Whereas with you weaving as, as many different elements in, how did you piece this together? Because it reads beautifully, but Thanks. I was... I was I was very astonished by just how much detail you were able to go in because you started Apollo One, um, and and I was very surprised that you were going to go that far back to start showing where the processes start breaking along the way on the way. Well, the, I mean, the reason for, for for starting with Apollo One is because when you when you look at the history of of NASA and NASA's you know catastrophic accidents. Yeah. Uh, at this, you know, distant remove, because we're now approaching 40 years since the Challenger accident. You know, one of the advantages of, of taking that long view is you can see that, you know, patterns in the story emerge. And you have an advantage that someone who's trying to write a book like this, you know, in the 18 months after it happens, does does not have. Mm -hmm. So although you say it's, it's going all the way back, it's not like I kind of, it's not like I set out to, to tell the story of the American space program from the beginning of the Apollo program <laughs> to last month, you know, yeah. what I did is I deliberately picked this moment because you can see in retrospect that what happened ultimately between 1967 and 2003 is that NASA essentially experienced the same accident again and again and again. Um, and the same problems had the same, you know, tragic result or similar tragic results in each case. So, when I first started researching the subject, when I was still trying to figure out whether or not I could write a book about this, or I, I would be interested enough in a book about this, or most importantly, whether anybody would be interested in reading a book about this, <laughs> then, then, then that was something that I planned out. It was like, yes, you know, you can see that not only are there parallels, which were the, the, the initial parallels I picked up, which is, which is, you know, here is, you know, in the case of Martha Chaffee, who's, who's the, the person with whom the, whose story opens the book, you know, here you have a woman standing on her doorstep, learning that her husband, who is an astronaut, is dead. You know, this is an experience that was shared again by, by, you know, husbands and wives, all the way through the program, then up until 2003. And so that so that's why I initially started looking into Apollo one. And then of course, the more I dug into it and, and read the, you know, the findings of the, the report afterwards, you know, it became clear that, that there are also, you know, structural causes and decision making that was made in Apollo one that was very similar to that, that led to Challenger in Columbia. Does that answer your question? It does. And oh. yeah, I, I, as, as I put my notes, I said, thank you for that. Apollo one always gives me nightmares. There's there's something about it which just upsets me because it's yeah you know, it's a test yeah you know, to be fair I'm sitting here wearing a North American aviation T-shirt which is probably not the best thing to do with a chat about Apollo one and, and and Challenger not that it was their fault on Challenger but it when you look at you know the the, um, the Velcro situation on it as well and the, mm -hmm. the tests about. You, you see the, the sort of test images of them with the Velcro just exploding in 100% oxygen. And we're not here to talk about that, but I just wanted to say thanks for that nice, after I read that chapter in bed going, great. Because that scene in Apollo 13 as well with the hand on the... Enough. It's categorized as go fever, this ailment that breaks NASA from time to time where they're pushing to meet something. And with Apollo, it was Kennedy's deadline of, of getting to the moon. It's something that you articulate very well. And I, I suppose, what is that? Because it's people process and those sorts of things tend to work well when the constraints around them are allowing for smooth operation of the process. When you put a very high level of pressure to meet a target onto something process tends to start falling apart. When you were looking at this, how, when you started seeing the effects of go fever, how did you see that as this malaise that seems to be inherent within NASA? Well, it's, I think it's inherent within the, the nature of, you know, experimental flight. I mean, with, uh, you know, the history of which I'm sure you know much more about than I do, but it seems to me that it's not about, um, 
it's not unique to the space program because the nature of go fever is that that you're you're always improvising right mm -hmm. and you're you and the nature of experiment of doing anything in experimental flight is you're learning as you go along because it never becomes operational and that was part of the you know the fallacy underlying the shuttle program ultimately um it's not operational because you because you're constantly doing new things you're 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 heading towards one apparently unreachable target and you're you're making mistakes all the way along and you're fixing them as you go and you've got and you've got to hurry along to your target you can't wait until everything works perfectly and then proceed from there because that's not how it works so i think you you know go fever is just a is is kind of overextending that procedure of of calculating acceptable risk and then taking the next step so that you you just get your sums wrong mm -hmm. you know and you and you because part of the the nature of calculating acceptable risk in in space flight is trying to decide what risks you can take and what risks you shouldn't take because they're putting people human beings in unacceptable areas of jeopardy so so i think that you know go fever just means that you're 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 going too fast with that process and i suppose does this mean that you're more susceptible to conf um, confirmation bias when you're looking looking at these things it's something that we can probably come back to when we look at the the sort of the readiness meetings that each I'm not even sure has. I know what the definition of confirmation bias is. So you're going to have to help me. It, it's 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 when you you believe you believe the outcome, and you're willing to work past known flags before you get to it. So it's you know oh yeah we we can get the, guess that I guess it's the same thing as the, the the fixing things as you go along. Not a great question. Let's move on because <laughs> no yeah. I, I I mean I'm not being I just don't know. It's one of those. It's one of those terms I've never really been certain of the definition of. It, in in my in, in yeah in in the day job when we're looking at these things, it's it's have you made a decision too early in in your process, and by doing that, are you then biasing the rest of your decisions because you've come to something too early based upon slightly flim, flimsy reasons? Um, right. Well, uh, so it's another way of saying that you think you understand something that you don't. Yeah, I've built a career on on, on that personally, but. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but whether, so that's what if that's what confirmation bias is, then that runs all the way through the story. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's let's go through. This. I was I was doing the math, so it's been about sort of fifteen years since the last shuttle launch. So there are people, many people around who, you know, I think my daughter who's twenty one, she had, had no no real desire to think about the shuttle. So I guess we need to just define what it what it was. And the bit that I always find fascinating about it is the, you know, the Max Fegert gliders and things like that, even, even while Apollo 11 is, is flying. When you started looking into that sort of nascent cell of, of aerodynamics coming up with a reusable spacecraft, the X-15, what did you find when you were looking at those original um, ideas for a reusable space plane? What did I find in, in what sense? In in their sort of intentions for what the shuttle ended up being, which was a slightly watered down version of it. Well, I mean the the I mean if you want to be very specific, I mean the the um the ideas that Max Faget came up with initially. Faget. Were, I knew were, I was gonna get his name wrong. I always get that. I'm just pronouncing it like an American would. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm sure that in Paris nobody's gonna be calling him Max Faget. <laughs> But I'm in New York, so I'm going to pronounce it that way. Go for it. Um, yeah. So, uh, but the you know the the original designs that 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 Faget came up with were were much more elegant and mm. uh, and efficient than the one that they ended up with, and 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 that was because of the you know the nature of the compromises that NASA as an organization had to make in order to get the thing off the drawing board and 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 built specifically that. You know, they had to effectively go into partnership with the Pentagon, with the Air Force, uh, in order to get their support to get it approved by Congress. Um, so they ended up with this kind of extremely large, heavy, delta-winged uh, 
spacecraft, which was very different uh, in its capabilities and its limitations than 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 Max's original um, straight winged. Um, what did he call it? He called it the DC three, I think, because mm-hmm. that was that was it was it was similar in size, I think, to the DC three. But yeah, so his so so his spacecraft would have been much lighter, much more elegant, smaller, but not as able to get, not able to have the same ability to fly as far across range as the space shuttle ended up being. Because it's interesting, while they're developing this aircraft, they're also looking at the people who would operate it, weren't they? So you you have a group of astronauts who have their moon missions cancelled, and then they bring in a wonderfully termed new group, which are quite different to the old the old right stuff sort of guys, don't you? So who was this new group of people wonderfully termed by the old hands at NASA's astronaut office? The, the TFNG group you're talking mm, about. Yes. Yeah. The 35 new guys is, is mm. what they will, if they will tell you they're officially called. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was the most diverse group of astronauts up to that point in NASA history. Although that wouldn't be hard because, you know, obviously every previous astronaut group had been composed entirely of white men, none of whom were that tall. Mm. But NASA kind of, although there had been attempts under the Kennedy administration to to introduce uh, more a more diverse intake of astronauts, so to include African-American candidates, and there had been a push, although not from within any government agency, for female astronaut candidates, you know, NASA had always managed one way or another to go with what were effectively, you know, prevailing social norms at the time and to say that, no, this is men's work uh, and white men at that. Um, But then there was federal legislation introduced in the early 70s that meant that all federal agencies had to take affirmative action effectively and to diversify their workforces. And so that was one of the of the main um, points of impetus that, that that forced them to open astronaut candidate applications up m- far more widely. But also they were aided by the fact that, you know, the shuttle was supposed to be this revolutionary new spacecraft, which would enable people to fly into space in a, in a shirt sleep environment. And so not everybody, you know, they could no longer really justify the qualification criteria that kept out African-American candidates and female candidates, which was principally that everybody who was going to be considered had to have tens of thousands of hours uh, in the cockpit of a high performance jet. And so once you, once you removed that demand, then it opened it up to people who were merely brilliant scientists and engineers and geologists and medical doctors. And, and so that's what happened. And so you had this, uh, selection of, of 35 men and women uh, containing a handful of African-American um, astronaut candidates and a handful of women, um, but still still predominantly white men. Um, and it was a fascinating group of people. You sort of delve into them beautifully and there's sort of a few names that sort of jump out along the way. And uh, yeah, Sally Ride is that sort of... Uh, straight up and down hero for how she is even even though i think uh, she probably wouldn't be delighted with her portrayal in for all mankind but that's for another another podcast i don't think she'd ever pull a gun on a commanding officer but oh i haven't seen i haven't seen any of it, that, it's so. really good it is really good but yeah as as you and i have both read quite a bit about deke slate and he comes off a lot nicer on the tv <laughs> than, uh yeah well that, yeah than in real life i don't think that'd be hard yes yeah. his Portrayals of yeah, again fascinating character. A podcast series on your own you could do on on Deke, but yeah, he's um, yeah he comes off a lot better in film and telly than he he did in real life because he he was he was to call him a traditionalist, probably conservative traditionalist is is being fair to him because he he wasn't particularly keen on this new group, was he? He was not. He refu- he he refused to participate in the selection process hmm. as soon as uh, he was informed that. They would be opening it up to to women, especially, and to uh, minority candidates. Then he he stood up and announced that he didn't want anything to do with it and left the the conference room uh, in in uh, 
in building one at the Johnson Space Center and and apparently never came back. I, I've got to do something specific on him because it's yeah. It's interesting. But let, let's talk about the, the spacecraft itself, because it's it's multiple bits. And when we talk about the shuttle, the orbital vehicle itself, we're saying we have a quite much di- much more diverse group of people on it, because you still have your two pilots, but there's also this new section of people on it as well, which are payload specialists. And I guess those are the, the brilliant engineers and scientists you were talking about before. Well, so mission specialists and payload specialists. Yes. And just from trying to remember all of those, it makes it a whole bunch more um, tricky. But what compromises were made to get to the space shuttle that we knew? Because it's a big thing. It's got the big fuel tank. It's got the solid rocket boosters on it. But there's a lot of things along the process that you delve into that went from the original design, the original intention, as you mentioned, what the Air Force needed as well from from their programs and Delta Flyer and, I'm uh, sorry, um, Sonic... Um, it's gone straight out of my head now. Cross um, range ability. Yeah, all, all of those things coming in. What what did the shuttle become as as we knew it from what it was intended to be? Well, the the, the main compromises were a result of of budgetary restrictions brought in because it was the early seventies when it was finally given the green light. It was in, in nineteen seventy two, galloping inflation the war in Vietnam, the cost of the Great Society program that that had begun uh, under President Johnson um, meant that effectively, you know, nobody had any money anymore. Mm. And so initially it was, it was the shuttle program is what remained when um, the White House had told NASA that they couldn't have any of the other aspects of the, the extremely ambitious Mars landing program that they had envisioned uh, in 1969, they ended up with the space shuttle. But then, moreover, when NASA went back to them and said, "Okay, well, we'll just stick to the space shuttle," and, and you know, the other thing about the space station, we'll kick that off into the future, and maybe we can do that at some point. But right now, we'll just concentrate on the space shuttle. And they did their budget calculations, and they came back and they said that it's going to cost about fifteen and a half billion dollars. And the budget analyst at the White House took a at that for a while and they came back and they said yeah well that's great uh you can do the special but you can only have five so i think those are those are the right numbers it's slightly less than not 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 a third but less than half is of what they asked for and this meant that they had to you know make all sorts of changes and cuts and compromises in the design of the shuttle but the two most important ones were that as you say you know it's a an orbital vehicle that rides into space on a giant central fuel tank full of pressurized uh, hydrogen and liquid oxygen and two rocket boosters that would provide the majority of the thrust to take it into orbit and would burn for about two minutes and then fall away at that point to be reused and recycled. And then the main engines of the shuttle would carry on the rest of the journey into space. Now, in the initial designs that Max Faget came up with, those uh, rocket boosters would be powered by liquid fuel engines like the ones that were in the Saturn V rocket that carried men to the moon. But those were both complicated and expensive and didn't really learn, lend themselves very well to being um, discarded and to splash down into the ocean, which is full of salt water, um, and, and would disagree somewhat with the complex plumbing of liquid rocket engines they were complicated and expensive and and not really very easily reusable Uh, whereas solid rockets which were regarded as much more simple you know lent themselves much more easily to that and were cheaper Mm -hmm. and Faget and uh, Werner von Braun and other senior engineers at NASA all said well this is a terrible idea because we think that solid rockets are much too dangerous to be used in manned flight. They've never been used by NASA for, for, for crewed vehicles before, and we shouldn't start now. But they were eventually convinced that um, that the solid rockets that had been used by the Air Force, particularly to launch satellites into space, had a, an apparently good safety record and were among the most reliable rockets ever built, apparently. So they signed off on the solid rocket 
uh, being used as the as the the main source of thrust to take the shuttle into space. But then simultaneously, the design also, for cost and budgetary reasons, failed to include any means of escape for the astronauts during the ascent phase. So it then became, the shuttle then became the first spacecraft in NASA history not to have any means of escape for the astronauts during that crucial and most dangerous um, part of the flight. So those were the two most important of, of many compromises that are in the shuttle design. Mm. Something that would come back to haunt them in 2003. But it's it's one of those things that you think that the lack of escape um, on this is, it, it, in hindsight, it's just one of those things you think is going to be asking for trouble, isn't it? You plan for the, you know, there's a hope for the best, plan for the worst. And in this case, they were planning for the best and hoping for the best. With, with but it rested like that. on the assumption that, that, that this was a system that was going to make spaceflight routine, that it was going to be what they eventually termed an operational system. So they would compare, they would, it would frequently be compared in the press to flying on an airline. So the argument that underlay the fact that they didn't have a, a, an escape system was that when you fly on a Boeing 747 as a passenger or as a member of the crew, there's no escape system because it just works well. And it works well so frequently that there's, there's never, you know, you wouldn't bother investing in, in something as drastic as an independent escape system um, because, you know, American Airlines doesn't do that. But obviously, there's you know there's a there's a there's a significant mismatch here because the space shuttle was never really an operational vehicle. It was always a dangerous and experimental vehicle, and they should have had an escape system. Mm -hmm. And NASA internally recognised that, and they were still having these conversations even after the shuttle started flying. And one of the most fascinating archival things that I came across when I was researching the book was there is this memo from. Uh, I think it's from 1984, where they're still discussing this at the Johnson Space Center and whether or not they should pursue uh, further experimental redesign possibilities to introduce an escape system. And this is eventually put on hold, not because it's complicated or expensive or it might not work, but because they are concerned about what the public would think if they found out that after this thing had started flying, it was so dangerous that it needed to have a redesign involving an escape system. A lot of the story is about public relations in a way. Yes. And I, I suppose that's something that NASA has always been able to maintain quite well, even even through those those difficult seventies periods, and you know, coming off of the highs of basically making moon landings dull, you know, it, I suppose it, it it it's one of those things. But saying that you're going to make that thing that you didn't used to tune into to watch on TV, we're going to do something new, and it's going to be equally routine. You can see how that could be palatable um, it, across Congress, which. Um, We'll be signing off on the money. We're going to take a quick break to pop to the Pima Air and Space Museum to visit with Director of Collections Andrew Bailey and find out about one of the aircraft in the incredible Pima collection. Hi, I'm Andrew Bailey, Director of Collections here at the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm here today to talk about our newest acquisition, a unique aircraft that we're really excited about adding to the collection. And you can see it right here behind us. And that's the Boeing 747SP Sophia. It's unique in two different ways. First, a Boeing 747 SP. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of what a Boeing 747 is, but many of you may not know what an SP is. During the 70s, Boeing came up with an idea of that they needed a different aircraft, a smaller aircraft that was a wide body that could compete with other smaller wide bodies like the DC-10 and the L-1011. They also wanted an aircraft that could fly long distances without having to refuel. So they came up with the 747 SP which is essentially a 747 with a shorter fuselage, about 47 feet shorter than the 747-100, a taller tail and other different changes. They allowed the aircraft to fly at higher altitudes and longer distance. The first one was delivered to Pan Am in 1976. 
It flew Pan Am's longest route, which was from New York City to Tehran in Iran, uh, nonstop. A year later, this aircraft went into service with Pan Am and was named Clipper Lindbergh, named after the famed aviator. The aircraft also spent time flying with United before retiring from airline service. Only 45 SPs were ever built, partially because they were just too expensive to maintain and to fly, and also newer airliners were coming out that could fly farther distances with a cheaper cost. So what does SOFIA stand for? SOFIA stands for Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. That means this aircraft has a 19-ton telescope mounted inside it. SOFIA was a combined project with NASA and the German Space Agency. Many space objects submit their energy in the infrared wavelength, which means they can't be seen through a traditional telescope, which is why this aircraft has an infrared telescope. SOFIA flew her missions at 45,000 feet, flying 99% above the infrared blocking atmosphere. This allowed the telescope to see things that ground-based telescopes couldn't see. SOFIA was also mobile. This allowed her to fly literally almost anywhere in the world to take observations. Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, even out over the ocean where there are no ground-based telescopes. Despite all this, last year NASA and the German Space Agency decided to retire SOFIA. We are lucky to have SOFIA retire here to the Pima Air and Space Museum, where she will be displayed along with other NASA aircraft like the Super Guppy, the Vomit Comet, and the NB-52A X-15 Mothership. To find out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum and to see the incredible collection that they have, please visit www.pimaair.org for more information and be sure to give them a follow via all the links in the description to this episode. And now, back to the show. Well, we need to talk about solid ro rocket boosters. We need to talk about power coal. And we need to ask the big question, really. In a solid rocket booster, which is something that the guys at Marshall didn't know anything about, what made it up that made the O-ring so important on it? Because at this point of your book, a very interesting group of men come in who you kind of cheer along, even though you know they're sort of shouting into the into the wind. Yeah, that, I mean they're they're among the heroes of the story. Really, is the the handful of of rocket engineers at Morton Tycho who tried to stop the launch um, on the eve of launch and, and and failed. The main thing about the solid rocket boosters, which you know are often described as being in principle a lot like giant fireworks. Mm -hmm is that they were absolutely massive fireworks. They're 150 feet high and they were 12 feet across. And so this meant that if you tried to build them as a monolithic rocket, 150 feet long and filled with extremely volatile solid fuel, which you could do, transporting it across the country from the rocket plant where it was built in Utah to Florida would be unspeakably dangerous because if something went wrong and the whole thing exploded in one piece i i mean i don't i i haven't seen a, like a, a a kind of projection of, of what would happen <laughs> if if that did take place but it would be it would be beyond catastrophic and there are other there are other uh, physical reasons why they couldn't really do that because the whole thing would sort of begin to sink under its own weight if you lay it down flat on its side um so so the design required that it be manufactured in sections in Utah and then transported in those sections by train all the way across the country on flatbed rail cars. And then, then only when it reached Cape Canaveral and it was taken to the vehicle assembly building would it then be put together uh, and stacked up vertically. And so the sections would be, would be built from the bottom up and they were designed to fit together very snugly to avoid leaks because once they were ignited, you didn't want any of the... Um, combustion gases from inside the combustion chamber of the rocket ex escaping through the through the joins so the sections of the rocket were were built with with what they call tang and clevis joints which were like the the tongue and groove in a floorboard which would just fit into one another and then there were holes drilled through both of those halves of the tang and the clevis which were pinned together with 177 steel alloy pins and then they were sealed with asbestos-containing putty, uh, 
But in order to make them extra tight, completely gas tight, they added two separate um, Viton, which is a kind of artificial rubber O-rings, which are to a, to, a, to a British audience are like the rubber washers in a tap. Again, only in principle, because in execution, the O-rings, although only a quarter of an inch thick, were 37 feet long. And as a result, they were extremely delicate. And the engineering tolerances of the joints were such that if there was any contamination of any kind around the O-ring when it was put over the joint and the, and the rocket slotted, the joints slotted together, um, contamination as small as a single human hair or a piece of lint, then that could cause a leak. So clearly, if there was any damage caused to the O-rings once the rockets ignited, then that could also prove catastrophic. Because if you get a, a leak, if you get a leak in the joint of a solid rocket, it doesn't just kind of leak out a little bit of hot gas for a while and then doesn't really bother anybody. What happens is a finger of hot gas emerges in the leak and then because it's burning at somewhere between 5,000 and 6,500 degrees Fahrenheit, it will just go straight through the half-inch steel case in the rocket um, and cut the rocket apart and then the entire shuttle will disintegrate or explode. How soon did they start finding issues with the O-rings? On STS-2, hmm. the second shuttle flight, they discovered that it was what they called erosion, which is a very misleading and benign sounding engineering term uh, that makes it sound as if, you know, it's a sort of gentle process that takes place over a long period of time, like the stones on the bed of a river being worn away by water over decades. But what would actually happen is in a fraction of a second, some of this extremely superheated hot gas would start drilling a hole in the, in the O-rings. Um, and this would usually happen in the first few milliseconds after ignition. And they began to find evidence of this from on the, the second shuttle flight in, in 1981. And, you know, initially the, the engineers at Morton Thiokol and at NASA, at the Marshall Space Flight Center, which oversaw all of the propulsion for these missions, you know, were very worried about this. But they analyzed their findings and they did some experiments and they thought that they figured out why it was happening and why they could prevent it getting any worse or, or, or even happening at all in the future. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what happened. For a few flights after that, they didn't see any more evidence of this erosion. But then, specifically after they changed the constitution of the asbestos-containing putty that they were sealing the joints with, they started to see these, these problems returning and then gradually over time getting worse and worse. And at each, in, at each point, in the story where the engineers recover the solid rocket boosters from the ocean and they, they pull the joints apart and they take a look at what's happened in those two minutes of flight. They're kind of initially alarmed and then they go over their numbers and they do some tests and, and they think they convince themselves once again that they understand what's happening and they can address the problem and they can make sure it will never cause a serious problem in the future. But that just keeps happening over and over and over again. And the, and the problems never go away. And as it turns out, they never really understand them. Because it's the, the thing I have to say is NASA had an incredibly ambitious flight schedule for the shuttles, didn't they? It, they were going to be flying almost like airliners. There was you know, hundred, hundreds of flights a year they were planning, wasn't it? It was it was. Nuts. Well, the idea yeah. initially was that, the, that they were, that's how they sold the shuttle, is mm -hmm. that they came up with this colossally expensive thing that they were given less than half the money they needed to make it. Um, but they told Congress that it would eventually pay for itself, but only if they reached this extraordinary flight rate, which, which they forecast in the early seventies would see this shuttle fleet, which at one point was, was intended to have as many as a dozen orbiters in it, um, flying as much as twice a week. So you're right. It was going to, I mean, it wasn't going to be an airline. You weren't going to have like 12 of them taking off every day, but it was going to be very, very, very frequent. And this was all built on the understanding that the shuttle was, you know, filled with these self-diagnostic avionic systems that the, that the um, technology they were going to be using, they just mastered almost immediately. And so that, you know, it would launch 
in the space like a rocket it would go into orbit it would stay up there for a week or so and then it would come back down and glide back down land on a runway and then you, you see these kind of the artist's impressions from rockwell from the early 70s which just really involves kind of a, a small group of white suited technicians like rolling up these these rolling staircases to the outside of the orbiter <laughs> and then just kind of you know flicking a sw few switches and, and like wiping down the windshield and changing the oil and then just getting it back on the launch pad and there you go you know and of course that never happened because it turned out the technology was just incredibly difficult almost every aspect of it was incredibly difficult to master and the, the, the it required you know constant maintenance and the engines of the the main the main engines of the shuttle for example which they imagined they would just have to you know tune up a bit when they returned to earth they ended up in a situation where they were having to completely remove them and rebuild them between missions because the 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 circumstances of their flight was so extreme and extraordinary we we could delve into things like the great tile caper and all all this stuff but dear listener go buy the book cuz <laughs> <laughs> it's well worth your time because we need to talk about the crew and it's a wonderful bunch of astronauts that were on, on challenger. Cause as you start sort of explaining their lives and, you know, uh, run through the name, you know, uh, Dick Scobie was the, the commander. Michael Smith was a pilot, Ron McNair, saxophonist by day, astronaut by, by night. Um, Ellison Onizuka as well, Judy Resnick, Gregory Jarvis, and of course, Krista McCullough, who was the, the teacher in space. It's a very, I guess it, we could say that this was the sort of crew that was almost the ideal for the space shuttle program, wasn't it? You have that mix of seasoned Air Force test pilots in, in, in Scobie and Smith. You've got quite mercurial sort of people like like McNair and, and, and Resnick in it as well. And then in, in Jarvis and McCulloch, you have the almost every man, every woman going to space. It's it, it seemed on paper to be the perfect crew for for NASA and what they were trying to achieve. Yeah, I mean it, it was there's a way in which the you know this was the most diverse crew of astronauts to emerge from the most diverse intake of astronauts mm -hmm. in NASA history. And it, you, you know, it, it seemed there's a scene in the book where one of the photographers who's down at, at the Cape, you know, photographing them for, for astronaut arrival a few days before the launch actually takes place, you know, says that it's like some sort of World War Two propaganda movie where it's, you know, the crew has been deliberately selected to to represent a cross section of of America. And you know, and I think that that's one of the reasons why the accident proved so. Um, such a shattering moment for, for people in America is because it, because it really did, there was a way in which it, it seemed to represent a, a melting pot vision of America. Um, not merely because, you know, it also included the, the everyman astronaut who, who anyone who'd ever wanted to go into space could kind of, could see themselves in, in the person of Krista McCormick. You know, it's, it, it's a name that I suppose a, a lot of people probably remember um, even though I completely forgot it when I interviewed um, Dave O'Keefe and, and Wayne, who were on the crew that brought up part of the heat shield the other year out of the Bermuda Triangle. Um, but just how big a deal was this teacher in space program? And by extension, how famous was Krista McAuliffe before she went into space? Because you, you sort of bring out just, you know, she was thrust into the PR spotlight to an incredible degree that I guess NASA hadn't really, hadn't really done before. Well, they, I mean, the reason for the, the creation of what was called the space flight participant program of which the teacher in space notion was a part, um, was because of this, this fact that NASA had become convinced very early on in their programs that, in order to continue to maintain funding for future projects um, and the cooperation of Congress, they needed massive public engagement. They needed the public to be extremely excited and enthused by what they were doing. And obviously this, this had you know, reached a zenith with the moon program. Mm -hmm. But what they discovered with the Apollo program was that, that, that 
no matter how spectacular and exciting and audacious and astonishing uh, their achievements were, you know, landing two men successfully on the surface of the moon in less than 10 years. Once the public had seen that happen, then, then they quickly grew disinterested, jaded and bored. And so ultimately we end up in a situation where within three years of the moon landing of Apollo 11, you know, people are calling in to complain about having um, footage of, of the astronauts of Apollo 17 walking on the surface of the moon, displacing their uh, expected soap opera fix of, of one particular evening in, in 1972. And, and so, and the same thing, exactly the same thing happened with the shuttle program. People were extremely excited in 1981 to see the world's first reusable spacecraft go into space. Quarter of a million people turned out in the desert in California just to watch it land. And they, you know, they were glued to their TV sets for the first few launches. But again, they quickly became bored with that. And, you know, it, as you alluded to earlier, this was sort of built into the nature of the program. The whole yeah. idea of it was that it was going to make spaceflight routine. And it did indeed seem to make spaceflight seem routine just because the launches took place quite frequently. So then they needed to come up with some means of getting people excited about what they were doing with the space program again. And one of the, the um, proposals for that was the Space Flight Participant Program, which was to send people who are not trained astronauts into space to be able to talk about and communicate the nature of the experience in a way that you know former test pilots seemed chronically unable to do. And so they, they conducted what was in many ways just a sort of giant talent competition. And Chris McAuliffe was the, was the, was the one person selected from more than 11,000 applicants of teachers from all over the United States and its dependencies. And the reason that she was chosen was not because she was the, you know, the most academically gifted um, or that she had the most um, fascinating and, and, and scientifically justified um, plan of what she wanted to do in space, but because she was extremely clever and very charismatic. And she was a brilliant salesperson for NASA and for the Teacher in Space program, a wonderful communicator. And so she was she was really very, very famous. She was inundated with, with autograph requests, from in, with interview requests, with autograph requests. She was on The Tonight Show. She was on, you know, breakfast TV shows. She was everywhere. And People Magazine, for instance, had all of their coverage for, for what they were going to do about her when she returned from the Challenger mission planned out far in advance. And I can't remember the exact statistic, but I think that there were four times as many journalists at, at the Kennedy Space Center for the launch as there had been for the previous one. You know, there was enormous public interest in, in McAuliffe. And she was really kind of, she was an American hero before she'd even arrived uh, at Cape Canaveral. It was the bit of school I enjoyed when we got to talk about, you know, teacher in space and things like that. And I remember my dad and I building a little Revel snap type model of, of the shuttle because that was, it, it was, it was crazy around that time for that launch and that crew. Um, I didn't know anything about the Jean-Michel Jarre collaboration with, with Ron McNair. I, that has completely slipped, slipped me by. That was, that was, that was brilliant. So there's, there's a lot going on on this flight, isn't there? There is. I mean, they were all fascinating characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, McNair was kind of amazing, and and um, and the the Jean Michel Jarre story where they had he and McNair had planned to have a what I guess you would call it a simulcast, mm. where Ron was going to play the saxophone, he was going to play a song that Jean Michel Jarre had written specially for him, and that they had spent <laughs> months rehearsing both in person and on, on over the phone with uh, Jarre in his studio in Paris and Ron in his garage in Houston. Uh, and, pre, and pre, the, zoom, the idea, pre zoom days, these dear listeners. Very, yes, very <laughs> pre zoom. And then and the, the idea was that, that Jean Michel Jarre had been, had been signed up to perform this massive outdoor concert in Houston to celebrate both, the, I think, the a, a, uh, Houston, the an, uh, centenary of the establishment of Houston, but also um, the anniversary of the arrival of NASA in Houston. He was going to play this outdoor concert and that at that point it was still planned that Challenger would be in orbit at that time. And therefore in the middle of the concert, Jar would begin playing, you know, the introduction to this song 
and then he would be joined live by McNair in orbit aboard the space shuttle playing his part of the song at the same time it's it's wonderful and yeah i you 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 really do paint a wonderful picture of the crew and judy resnick being a lot seems to be a lot of fun and i mean that in a in a true sense of just being as free spirited as being an an, as an astronaut as as there could have been yeah Um, i think she i mean to those people that knew her she certainly was and but she presented a very different face you know to 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 people who wanted to interview her quite uh, unsurprisingly, when mm. you see some of the interviews that she was forced to do, um, there's one that, that she does with, there was one that she did on, on uh, one of the morning shows around the first shuttle launch in which she's actually asked if she's too cute to be an astronaut. What happens when you meet a man who's not in the space program and doesn't know who you are and you say, I'm an astronaut? Does he say, hey, you're too cute to be an astronaut? Come on, little lady, you can't be an astronaut. I just tell him I'm an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Which for, a, you know, a, name, and a, 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 very, a massively overqualified electrical engineer, that's, that's obviously <laughs> going to be quite annoying. I have so many more questions, Sass. I'm just looking at the time. I, I think, go buy the book. You know, this, this is pure teaser, dear listener, for, for doing <laughs> Because yeah, well, I'm not going to argue with that. Yes, <laughs> yes, I'm by the book. Absolutely. Let's stop talking about this now. Because yeah, there's yeah, you know, just look, looking down my list of things to chat about. There's the yeah, you know, the second cold snap that they never thought they'd have. Well, challenges on the pad. There's that incredibly tense meeting to discuss the O-rings just before launch as well. And I just want to sort of bring up. Roger, is it Roger Boys Jolly? Boys Jolly? It's Roger Beaujolais. We're having Beaujolais. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, I'm getting know, all the names wrong. Names, man. They're really. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just so unpredictable. Roger Beaujolais. Uh, that's how they say it. But you know, I, I, I've, it, I have the advantage over you of, of having spoken to dozens of people where I would go. Where initially I would indeed go. Wait, it's Roger. Do you say this boisily? How do you say this? And, you know, I was corrected about it so many times over the course of researching the book. But now I can say with assurance, it's Beaujolais. Of course it is. <laughs> I'll edit it. So I'll just have that last bit. It's Beaujolais. How can you make you look as good as possible? Of course. Yeah. But Roger Beaujolais, Arnie Thompson and Al McDonald are names I can pronounce, which are fab. But that that group. And then their performance, performance, that's a terrible way of putting it, before the, the, the commission that looked into it. What's a remarkable group of, of men who, who tried very, very hard to stop this? And I, I suppose the question for them is, when you were researching them, what was sort of your feeling towards them as you went along? Because you think of the, the rocket engineers that had a fault that they never rectified. They, they could have come across quite differently. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it like that. I mean, I, I, um, you know, when I, I mean, the process of researching something like this, I guess the important thing to, to, to explain is that, the, you know, working on this and working on the Chernobyl story, similarly, you know, I, is, is kind of, it's iterative. It's like, it's like, um, it's like painting an oil painting, I guess, not that I've ever painted one. But you start with a cartoon that you do in charcoal and then you slowly build up, um, you know, a more detailed sketch. And then you start filling it in with, with oil paint and you're layering and layering and layering. And so, so, you know, initially I've got a rough idea. I think I have a rough idea by reading secondary sources of what the whole story is, right? And so then you can map it out and structure it. And you can do things like, oh, yeah, well, the Apollo 1 seems to be where this arguably could start if you're if if you're going to do it like that. So I had an idea that you know there were these rocket engineers who, who who you know in this infamous teleconference you know put their hands up and and said we don't think this is a good idea and that they were overruled. But it wasn't until I was very deep into the research process that I had a very lucky break, which was that at the muse at the archive of the National Air and Space Museum in Chantilly, Virginia, the one where all the plane, you know, by the airport, Mm -hmm. I went looking for something else. I'd been, having spoken to Joe Trento, who was a space writer who had written one of the two 
non-fiction narratives about the accident that were published in the in like 1987 immediately after the accident mm -hmm. and i spoke to him and he explained to me that he donated all of his papers to mm -hmm. the national Air and space museum uh and so if i wanted to have a look at them you know i should go down there and i wasn't able to do that until like two years into the re research because it had been closed because of covid19 mm -hmm. but i went in there to look through these these interview transcripts of interviews that Joe had done with senior NASA figures, um, you know, who died long before my research started. In, and I dealt with that stuff very quickly. There wasn't really very much there, but I determined that I was going to, you know, there's this Robert Caro, famous Robert Caro statement about turn every page. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I'm here for a couple of days, so I better make sure I just go through every single piece of paper in these file boxes. And at the end of one of them, I found this uh, padded envelope that had a, a an unmarked CD in it. And... Um, and it eventually turned out that what was on this CD was a 600 page word document that was a, was a memoir that Roger Beaujolais had written and completed in 1999, but had never seen the light of day. And what I discovered in reading that was this, you know, initial conception that I had that there was this meeting and, the, you know, a few engineers had gone, you know, no, things are very good. In Beaujolais case, this story went back almost 10 years. Because not only had he been the guy who had taken apart and, and examined for post-fight post inspection the solid rockets from the previously coldest launch they'd ever had, which was in January 1985, and at that point become quite frightened about the way that he believed cold weather might affect the sealing of these O-rings. But he had been a sort of troublesome employee at every operation that he'd worked in for years, because he was like a, he was a really brave and principled individual. But most significantly, back, all the way back in 1974, he'd worked with this guy who just flipped out one morning, unexpectedly, and as far as Beaujolais was concerned, completely inexplicably. And only after he'd almost come to blows with this guy who seemed to pick a fight with him, did he find out that the reason this guy was so freaked out was because he had been an engineer who had worked on the design of the Douglas DC-10 and feared that there was this engineering problem with it that could cause a catastrophic accident. But he was ignored and his, his insistence that something was going to go wrong was brushed aside, not only by the, the aerospace company he worked for, but also by the FAA. And then years later, that resulted in a catastrophic accident in which um, almost 400 people were killed in the crash of, of a, of a DC 10. Um, and it clearly destroyed this guy's life and witnessing this happen almost in real time, convinced Beaujolais that if he was ever in a similar situation, he would never let that happen to him. So, and, and I hadn't read about this anywhere else until I found Beaujolais memoir. So I was just like, wait a minute, this is kind of, you know, this guy is not merely one of a handful of people who just participates in this meeting. It, his story is a, is a, is a kind of, has a terrible, tragic arc that goes all the way back into the mid 1970s. So that's why Beaujolais ended up being, you know, such a central part of the of the book. He seems, I think you put it best, a very principled, very smart engineer. That, that's how how you 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 portray him, I guess, from from you reading in the research of of that. That's how he came across to you as well. Yeah, and mm -hmm. people that knew him. Yeah, I mean, I, because I spoke to the rocket engineers who were the surviving rocket engineers who were in the room in that meeting at the time, and people that knew Beaujolais very well, um, and people that knew him in the years after the accident, because you know after he'd attempted to have it stopped, then you know one of the most kind of fascinating and troubling parts of the story is that then senior NASA managers really. I mean, cover up is a very strong word, but they definitely dissembled and misled the investigators about the nature of that meeting to the extent that, you know, for the initial parts of the inquiry, every time the idea of, of a meeting where reservations were expressed on the eve of launch came up, their line was to say, yes, yes, we did. Yes, you're absolutely right. We did have a meeting. And um, concerns were raised about the temperature and the O-rings. But in the end, we just all agreed it would be fine. And, and none of them was prepared to say initially 
that these that Morton Thiokol gave an official recommendation on paper not to launch, and that that recommendation was then that recommendation was then reversed, and they stuck with that until Al McDonald stood up in a in a closed meeting to say, you know, actually, um, we said don't launch, and then they everybody changed their minds, hmm. um, and then subsequently, Beaujolais and other engineers from from Morton Thiokol joined McDonald in effectively becoming whistleblowers to hand over sheaves of documents to, that revealed exactly how much was known about the failures of the solid rocket O-rings long before the accident took place um, and the nature of the meeting. And as a result of that, although he was you know, publicly lauded and given awards, Beaujolais never worked in the aerospace industry ever again, and his life was effectively destroyed. Which is the fate of many a whistleblower, which is terribly tragic. I'm slightly distracted because as we come to the end of our chat, I'm quickly looking at whatever we're calling Twitter these days, because as we speak, there's a press conference going on about what the hell's going on with Starliner being stuck on the space station. So it's odd to be discussing one of NASA's worst disasters while they have Yet again, another troublesome spacecraft, at least this time, <laughs> on, on the International Space Station and, 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 and not coming, coming back anytime soon by the looks of it. So it's, it's interesting how spaceflight hasn't got any easier, despite all the sort of wonderful special effects we see with, with these other companies here. But I think my takeaway from the book, as I said, when Wendy said, or as she's reading it, said it's it's not an angry book, but it makes you angry, and I think that's that's high achievement to you because you know for 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 that for that crew of remarkable people who had yeah one meetings away from and to be fair, what wasn't the weather the day before almost perfect for launch as well? It, it's, yeah. it's 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 it, it well, is the, the truth is, and this is one of the most surprising things I. I discovered in the research was that it really came down to the to the opinion and the behavior of one man mm. because in order to reverse their recommendation from from no go to go the thiacal executives had to have considered that they had to have a unanimous vote of the four most senior men in the room and the three most senior men in the room all quickly reversed themselves but then the fourth one who was the head of engineering for the whole company knew what the what the stakes were and understood what would happen if something did go wrong and was really, really didn't want to change his mind, but just didn't have the will to stand up to the pressure that he was put under. And eventually, you know, under extreme pressure, um, agrees to change his mind. And, and, and from that point onwards, there was, you know, there was no turning back. Th those those peer pressure in those meetings must have been insane. Adam, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you for taking a bit of time out of your afternoon to chat for us. Give the book a plug because it's got, he says, looking across at it, I've only got the, the dust cover because my, oh, that's the wrong book. I, got, <laughs> I was going to say, that doesn't look familiar. That's also a very good book, dear listener, but that's for another thing. Give it a plug. What's what's it called? I've only got the, the dust cover with, with me because my wife is downstairs reading it before we sneak off to the um, the, the pub for Friday night. Oh, it is, so, it, the book is called Challenger, A True Story of Heroism and Disaster on the Edge of Space. And it is out now at all good and evil bookshops. Support your local indie, dear listener, of course. Adam, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. And like I said, the, the book is superb and many congratulations on it. Thank you for having me. I cannot thank Adam Higginbotham enough for joining us here on the Damcasters and for his book, which we will be plugging quite relentlessly. And Challenger is a superb piece of work, incredibly meticulously researched, incredibly meticulously researched. There you go. There's double barrel bit of nameage for you there. But it is it is really, really good. And my wife's reading it now. She's she's just finishing it off. And she went very quiet when she was reading it last night as she got to the explosion. And that's the effect that Challenger still has. And that it's not been forgotten, that we're still finding 
new elements of it that people like Adam are able to bring to our attention is quite something. NASA still has Starliner as we record this on the space station. And I think tomorrow morning when I'm recording this, so a week ago when you get this, they're still figuring out what to do. So hopefully they'll have come home by by then. But space flight is hard, people. And let's never forget that or the heroism of those that go to space. Now, as always, we have to thank our incredible partners at the Pima Air and Space Museum. They have a fantastic space section, which funnily enough, I will be getting to on my next visit because I've not spent a lot of time in there, nor have I done any videos. So that's on the list for that. Head over to www.pimaair.org to find out when the next Night Wings event is happening as well. That's going to be great. And all the events they've got through the summer with the summer programs. Be sure to check them out. And of course, you can become a Damkister on Patreon. Get your name in the credits at the end. Welcome packs, all that good stuff. Coasters are coming as well because we all need somewhere to put our beer. Head over to the link in our description below. It'll probably be on the bottom of the screen here for more and join from just three pounds a month. Check out the credits as well. They're fun. They took forever to figure out how to do because editing. Until next time, everybody, thank you so much for your support. Please do like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. Tell your friends, but please check in on your friends as well. It is summertime. We have lots on, but sometimes that's the toughest time for people. So check in on your mates. Make sure everybody's okay. Do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Dam Castiers on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.